Everyone knows what a vampire is, a ravenous undead that survives by drinking the blood of the innocent, a creature of the night that sleeps on a coffin and avoids the light of the sun, the latter which can obliterate the monster and turn it into ash. The fable of the vampire is as old as time, and as such, there are many variations of the monster. Some vampires are known to transform into wolves, others can summon them, many can turn into swarms of bats, while some can phase right through walls or control the will of others. The legends and stories of the vampire are as plentiful as they are terrifying, considering that they are one of the only undead that can actually pass as living creatures to unsuspecting humans, they easily spread fear amongst the populace of any realm they inhabit. Unlike other monsters, these vampires enjoy the power and control they exert upon mortals. They manipulate them to grow their influence, their wealth and their power, all to mask the real tragic nature of their existence, the fact that they are no longer alive and that nothing will quench the thirst they have for the life they once lost. Today, we're going to cover the general features of vampires, including, of course, as always, all of the interesting things that they do not tell you in the 5th edition Monster Manual. However, there is so much to cover that I will have to break this down into two or more videos, just like I did for the Beholder series, because, man, there is just a lot. However, before we get into it, this video is brought to you by Grim Hollow Transformed, an entirely revised, updated, and expanded remaster of the fan favorite setting for Grim Hollow. Enjoy the setting that brought Dark Fantasy to 5th edition with both the player's guide and the campaign guide, currently right now on Kickstarter. Grim Hollow is set in the world of Etheris, where you can play grim adventures in a godless world. The campaign guide not just explores this world, but teaches you how to run dark fantasy, gives you magical items and spells that fit on those themes, gives you custom rules to better play a more gritty style of adventure, and gives you diseases and curses to fit that narrative. All in all, it is an all-encompassing book designed to allow you the chance to run monsters like werewolves, vampires, hags to the best of your abilities, or to run themes like plagues, religious crusades, witch hunts, and many more that are super fun to explore in a dark fantasy world. Or perhaps you want to explore gothic fantasy or gothic horror. There are so many locations within the Theris that fits that mold perfectly, as well as, of course, rules on how to get your players to become vampires. Regardless of whether you end up playing in Etheris or not, this book is shock full of incredible content that fits every type of campaign your dungeon master might throw at you. It has an entirely new class called the Monster Hunter, an intelligence-based martial class to put into practice expert knowledge against your foes. There are also over 40 different subclasses such as the Oath of Slaughter Paladin, the Sanguine Thief or the Primordial Ranger, and not least, over 12 different transformations that characters can undergo if they choose to let themselves be tempted to change into monsters. There are deep rules that cover how a character can transform into a werewolf, a vampire, a lich, a ghost, and so much more. In fact, it was the fellas over at Ghostfire Gaming that asked me if I could do a vampire lore video to celebrate the release of the Kickstarter. And I said, just one? I am celebrating two. I am doing four. We're going to explore everything there is to explore about vampires, all thanks to our friends at Ghostfire Gaming. Check out Grim Hollow Transformed, currently on Kickstarter. The link is in the video description. Their original book was incredible, and their device and expanded content can only make them better. So please check out the link in the description below. But now, back to the video. Alright, now before we begin, we're going to cover the 5th edition entry first, since this is a pretty good entry and it covers a lot of the basics. We're going to go pretty fast through this, just going over the main points that already everyone knows about these creatures. To start with, vampires have a hunger for life, which they sate by drinking the blood of the living. They hate sunlight because it burns them, and they never cast shadows or reflections. The victims of a vampire become a vampire spawn, which are similar to a vampire except that they are under the control of the vampire that killed them. The spawn can only free itself if the master vampire either dies or offers it its blood willingly. All vampires are bound to the place in which they were originally interred after they died and must sleep there during the day. It can transport this burial place but can only rest in that location. And lastly, they do not require air to breathe. Now, this section right here, uh, Dark Desires, this is actually crucial to understanding how vampires work. But the real key takeaway here from this entire paragraph is the word symbols. Vampires are all about symbolism. 
So long as you understand that, you know how vampires work. When a vampire seeks a harem of slaves, he's not looking for sex. He is looking for what such a harem would symbolize, which in this case would be power. When you put a mirror right in front of a vampire's face, you might wonder why he would be afraid of seeing his lack of reflection in it. But the thing is, he hates the fact that he casts no reflection, for he is nothing. His life is gone. His memories are like dust in the wind, and he will never get those back. And that is real symbolism, which hurts the vampire more than any tangible blast of holy energy that you could ever cast. Now this here is a stat block for the vampire and it is a big one. The alignment here of vampires is actually interesting because much like the living humanoids, a vampire can be whatever it wants to be. Traditionally, one could categorize vampires as chaotic since when a creature becomes a vampire, they usually discard all of the morals, laws, and restrictions that bound them in life to become something more free, something more unbound, something that follows its whims and desires. However, they are inexorably stuck with the restrictions the power of symbolism forces upon them, and by strictly following those rules, if you want to call them that, they end up being chaotic creatures forced into being lawful, if that makes any sense. Now, canonically, stat-wise, vampires only gain strength and resilience from their vampirism in most editions, though in 5th edition, and also in Ravenloft, by the way, all vampires also gain a large boost to their dexterity. From there, thanks to their immortality, they inevitably become smarter from learning after centuries of living and become also incredibly adept at manipulating others. Hence, it follows that they would have a very high intelligence and charisma as well. Wisdom, interestingly enough, is really the only stat that remains true to what the vampire was before its transformation. And ironically, it's also what defines how much of the creature's previous self is left over after its own death. Putting it simply, the higher the creature's wisdom, the more likely it is for the vampire to retain its memories, its old alignment, and its personality. So it is proper, after all, for it to be the only stat that actually remains a constant for the life of the vampire. Now, moving on, we can see here that they get resistance to necrotic damage, though, uh, interestingly, virtually in all editions before 5th edition, all of them gave vampires resistance to both cold and lightning damage, but that was omitted in this edition. Now in here, uh, we can see that vampires can transform into either a bat or into a cloud of mist, the latter of which is used automatically if the vampire is defeated, and which allows the vampire to return back to its sarcophagus in order to heal. The vampire has a very powerful regeneration, which can only be counteracted by either sunlight or running water, and it can perfectly climb walls and ceilings without falling. And here we have the fabled weaknesses of the vampire. Uh, first, the vampire cannot enter a residence without an invitation from one of the occupants. Second, the vampire is harmed by running water. Third, if a wooden stake is driven into the vampire's heart while it is incapacitated in its resting place, the vampire is paralyzed until it is removed. And fourth, the vampire is harmed by sunlight. While in sunlight, it struggles to make attacks or perform skills. Now, we will of course go into much more depth later on about these detriments and most of them on a follow-up video, but for now, let's keep going. Here are the actions of the creature. It is good at striking with its claws and grubbing opponents, the latter which he needs to do in order to use his bite. The bite of a vampire drains its opponents, and if the victim dies from the bite and is then buried in the ground, it rises as a vampire spawn under the control of the vampire in the following night. Here we have the dangerous charm of the vampire, one of the most powerful charms in the game. A charmed victim heeds the words of the vampire and must protect it for 24 hours and is a willing target for the vampire's bite. This here is a brutal effect and is one of the vampire's most powerful weapons. And then lastly here at the very end, Children of the Night. The vampire can magically summon either swarms of bats or a pride of wolves to aid him. These animals obey the will of the vampire and fight for him for up to one hour. But there you have it, the monster stat block for the vampire as it is showcased in 5th edition. The vampire spawn stat block here follows the same pattern as the vampire except that it lacks the ability to transform, to charm, and to control animals. But okay, now that we have seen what the 5th edition monster manual offers you, let's talk about what they did not tell you about vampires. <laughs> Now, what better place to start than blood and the vampire's need for it? 
Much how a person requires food and water to survive, as it grants them the energy to fuel the biological processes of their body, so does a vampire require blood, which revitalizes the monster and sustains him. A vampire must feed at least once every single day to remain healthy. If not, they grow paler, sluggish, and more inhuman. Generally speaking, a vampire can pass for a living creature in a town or a city, but if the vampire hasn't fed as of late, the distinctions become a lot easier for everyone else to see. The creature's touch would feel cold, the eyes would appear more feral, and of course, the hungrier the vampire, the more irrational it would become. Eventually, the vampire dies if it doesn't drink any blood, and on those last stages before it perishes, it would become a bloodthirsty monster, too ravenous to think, who lunges at the first thing that it can think it can devour. Now, on the other hand, a well-fed vampire is flush with life, red on the cheeks, full of energy, charismatic, sharp, and alert, all the more easy to pass as a living creature. Interestingly, the older the vampire, the less blood it requires, but the hungrier it becomes. A fledgling vampire, recently transformed, must likely drink every single day lest it perishes, while a patriarch, the oldest and most powerful kind of vampire, could probably withstand three weeks or more without feeding, but might be less inclined to leave a victim alive after feeding on them. Instead, rather just drain his victims entirely as it feels that pang of hunger much stronger than others. Traditionally speaking, vampires can survive a number of days without blood equal to their level or the amount of hit die they possess. So the vampire spawn on the 5th edition monster manual, for example, seeing as it has 11 hit dies, could withstand up to 11 days without feeding before it would perish. Now, vampires can only drink fresh blood in order to revitalize their bodies, meaning that they can only drink it from either living beings or those that have recently perished. Drinking it from a dead creature is not just unsatisfying, but also has a tendency to make them sick. It is not preferable to them, though of course, they will do what they have to do in order to survive. As a general rule of thumb, as long as the corpse has not been dead for longer than 4 hours, a vampire should be able to feed on it. Anything more, and it is basically impossible. Drinking from still living creatures is definitely the way to go, which is actually why they prefer to charm those that they feed from, so they can feed in peace without having to do so while the creature is struggling. It also helps that a living creature has the heart beating the blood through the circulatory system, so when the vampire cuts or pierces the flesh of the victim, the blood more readily gushes out, which of course makes it easier then for the vampire to suck. They also prefer to drink the blood of humanoids of the same kind as they are, which further nourishes them when compared to that of others. In other words, elf vampires will seek to feed upon elves, rather than humans. The farther the creature is to the vampire's kind, the more disgusting the blood would taste, and the more prone to sickening them it would be. For example, a vampire can indeed feed from a wolf's blood, but it would be distasteful. It would grant them only a limited amount of sucker and would have a high likelihood of poisoning them. Vampires drink the blood of their victims generally from two locations, the neck and the inner thigh, as these locations are close to major arteries of the body. The neck, though, is the most commonly seen, one, because it is usually readily accessible to the vampire. Not many people carry armor that blocks one's neck, for example. And two, well, most people's necks are generally visible, meaning that if a person has had their neck bitten, it is just simply more likely for someone to notice them. Inner thighs are usually covered in clothing, obviously, so even if a vampire bit that area, it would be unlikely for someone else to notice. But it is also rarer simply because it would require the vampire to disrobe the victim before it could feed, which is not usually necessary with the neck. Now, the vampire has elongated canines, which are very sharp and protrude just ever so slightly outward of the mouth, which they use to bite on their victim in order to make them bleed, and then from the wound, they would suckle the blood out. Other than being unnaturally sharp, the canine teeth of a vampire are similar to that of the normal teeth of a mortal. So, for example, they are not hollowed out, and the vampire wouldn't just drink blood through the teeth like a straw, as some might believe. Instead, they simply suckle the blood as a babe might drink milk from its mother. 
Even a small wound left behind by the bite of a vampire causes visible trauma onto the flesh of the area of the bite. Typically, the bite marks are less than half an inch in size, and then the area around it grows bruised, caused by the bleeding that transpires below the skin. This bruise is usually an inch big around the bite marks and is easy to spot for anyone that can see it. Now, interestingly, this bruise does not cause any discomfort or pain whatsoever upon the victim. In fact, if the victim was charmed or asleep when the bite transpired, they may not even know or realize that they were even bitten by a vampire, unless they were to see, of course, the wound. Other than the bite marks, the only other visible signs might be that the victim would feel a bit paler or weakened, but these would just be signs of blood loss rather than anything special relating to the vampire. Victims of a vampire's feeding generally survive. That is because the vampire does not actually want to kill his victims, most of the time. Charmed targets do not usually remember the vampire, which is good since it allows the vampire to stay hidden. But also, those that die from a vampire would often be reborn as vampires themselves. And a vampire does not usually want to create more vampires, certainly not every single time that it would feed. More vampires would mean more mouths to feed, which would mean less people for the original vampire to feed on. A vampire can also only maintain control over so many spawns. Creating too many would risk some of them becoming free, which inevitably will seek to supplant the original vampire. In other words, vampires do not tend to want to kill people. They could drink from their blood and then of course decapitate the victims afterwards so they wouldn't rise as a vampire later on, but then that just tells everyone in the village or the city that there is a vampire nearby and that just brings trouble to the creature. So overall, they simply seek to avoid all that and just feed in secret. Now, the feeding of a vampire is described as being pleasurable to the victim, especially so when charmed. See, I bet you all have wondered how come a creature charmed by a vampire is a willing target for the vampire's bite, considering that most charm effects break when a creature is forced to do something that harms them. Well, that is because in this case, the victim of a vampire's charm does not consider the bite to be a harm, because it does not feel like a harm. First of all, the bite doesn't hurt, but second, and most importantly, there is almost like a sexual component that is attributed to the bite of a vampire, one that the charmed victim wants to happen. Now, this is particularly so in Ravenloft more than any other setting, but there is also a little bit of this in the Forgotten Realms, at least in the oldest of lore. For example, in the first edition Lord of Darkness book for Forgotten Realms, vampires usually attacked only members of the opposite sex. Also, the most powerful kinds of vampires, called the Greater Vampires, which are the vampires that can walk freely in the sun, are only created when a succubus kills a creature with their draining kiss. And so, the vampire would inherit the succubus' ability to drain a victim, while having the victim, of course, sort of enjoy it. There's also an unspoken but a high possibility that these greater vampires were actually the first vampires from which, of course, the rest would originate from. Now, this is from Ravenloft, which is, of course, the setting for the famous Curse of Strahd campaign. Quote, This is one of the most insidious factors in the nature of vampirism. It would seem that there is some deep and dark desire within the psychology of demi-humans that makes them submitting to a vampire's kiss somehow attractive. Vampires are often portrayed as creatures with an intense sensual appeal. This, it seems, allows charmed victims to believe that offering their throat to a vampire is not the self-destructive nor even suicidal act that it is. In addition, some victims that have survived the attentions of a vampire report that the experience was highly pleasurable, much as this may fly in the face of reason. They felt no pain as the beast opened the wound in their flesh and described the actual sensation of the feeding as one of voluptuous pleasure. I have also heard the words used by a vampire while attempting to charm a victim into allowing it to feed. The monster seems to instinctively perceive a desire to submit that lies in the dark recesses of the human mind. It plays upon this desire, talking about the gentle joy of surrendering or opening oneself and of experiencing the unequaled bliss of total sharing. Vampires often feed from sleeping victims, 
If the victim is not awakened when the vampire makes the wound, he or she remembers nothing of the experience when they awaken normally. At the very most, the victim recalls that he or she experienced a dream of intense and sensual pleasure. End quote. As you can see, much how a dryad might charm men, basically relying on beauty and sexual appeal, a vampire often does so as well, though not necessarily always. It really does depend on the kind of vampire. All vampires are different, and this I cannot stress enough. It is not just that vampires are different because all peoples are different. They are different because many vampires have different properties and rules that define them. A vampire generally obtains his powers from the vampire that created them, and the one that created them got his from the one that created them as well, and so it goes. Each vampire bloodline is unique and carries with it different properties. Like I said in the intro, some might be able to turn into wolves, while others simply might not. And then, the older a vampire gets, the more powerful they become. And the more powerful they become, the more likely for them to develop unique characteristics that define them. Characteristics they might be able to pass on to those they transform, potentially creating entirely new bloodlines. Generally speaking, a vampire is considered a fleshling until they have been a vampire for at least 100 years, and they are considered a patriarch, the most powerful they can get by virtue of age, when they pass their first millennium. Here is an easy graph from Ravenloft detailing the titles for each of these age brackets. Just know that vampires don't actually call each other these titles, it is merely a way to categorize them from a meta perspective. Uh, since all vampires know that the older they are, the stronger they become, uh, vampires use their age as a metric to define seniority amongst themselves. So the older vampires generally have more sway in inter-vampire politics. They also use age as either an honorific or as an insult amongst each other. For example, if a vampire is trying to butter up an older vampire, they might call them old one or ancient one. Such an address would be flattering to the vampire. On the other hand, an older vampire that is seeking to demean a younger vampire might call them young one or a child, which would be insulting to them. Strahd, as it so happens, is 429 years old, meaning that he sits squarely in the ancient age bracket. After all, he is the ancient and he is the land. All right, we're gonna end it here for today, guys, but there is a lot more that we gotta cover. Like, we only covered blood and age brackets here. We still have strengths, weaknesses, methods of creating vampires, and more. Did you know that the saliva of a vampire is diseased and can kill you? Did you know that if a vampire feeds on a pregnant woman, the baby can be born a half vampire? Just, just wait and see for our next two videos on vampires. They're gonna be great. Now, if you want to play as a vampire, as a 5th edition full character class with features from level 1 to level 20, uh, please do check out my website at mrx.store, where I have Monster Classes 3, which includes, amongst the Treant and the Familiar, it includes the Vampire. The Vampire has a Font of Darkness feature that grants it a pool of blood points, which it can spend to activate the powerful vampiric abilities of the class. Using blood points, it can regenerate its hit points over time, it can charm enemies, and it can activate the myriad of abilities that you can select for your vampire. No vampire is the same, and the monster class allows you to customize your vampire by selecting nocturnes, which function very similar to Eldritch Invocations. There is a long list of vampiric abilities to choose from to determine what kind of bloodline your vampire belongs to. You can be an Animagus, which allows you to transform into beasts, or perhaps your vampire is particularly good at manipulating and charming others. Or perhaps you have the Penumbral Gift, allowing you to summon and control shadows. Uh, check out the PDF and more at MrRex.store, where I have countless cool products to improve your Dungeons & Dragons experience. And also, of course, don't forget to check out the Grim Hollow Kickstarter, guys, currently running right now by clicking the link at the top of the description. Now, thank you all so much, and I will see you all next time.